Since its earliest days, the facilities on this site have addressed the most pressing public issues of the time, from poverty to epidemics, to crime, to complex health conditions. Starting with the Dawn Jail and the House of Refuge in the 1860s, proceeding to the Isolation Hospital, Riverdale Hospital, and now Bridgepoint Active Healthcare, the facilities on this site have and continue to address issues of public health and wellness. In the decades leading up to the building of the Dawn Jail, Toronto grew from a town of roughly 4,000 to a city of more than 40,000. By the early 1860s, Toronto had built canals and railways. It had amassed a fleet of steamers, schooners and barges on Lake Ontario. There was a stock exchange and a new class of merchants, manufacturers, importers, brewers and distillers. This period of change and opportunity attracted thousands of immigrants, mostly from Ireland, England and Scotland. As the population increased, so did Toronto struggle with poverty, alcohol and crime. The city's jails were no longer sufficient. In 1856, Toronto purchased parts of the Scatting family property on the west side of the Don River to build a new jail and house of refuge to serve the growing population. The countryside setting outside the city limits was considered ideal for a new jail, according to the prison reform thinking of the day. One of Canada's most respected early architects, William Thomas, was awarded the commission to design the Don Jail. Thomas was a founder of the Association of Architects, Civil Engineers and Provincial Land Surveyors and designed more than 100 buildings in Canada in the mid-1800s. These include Toronto's St. Lawrence Hall and St. Michael's Cathedral. Like much of Thomas's late work, the Don Jail is in the Renaissance Revival style, a popular style in the mid-1800s. This style drew inspiration from Italian, Renaissance, Baroque and Mannerist architecture. Thomas died in 1860, before the construction of the Don Jail was complete, leaving the project to his two sons, William and Cyrus. When it was first built, the Don Jail was considered a palace compared to the primitive facilities and overcrowded conditions of Toronto's first three jails. The interior of the Dawn Jail was intended to provide ample light and air to create an open space conducive to moral and physical health. The central pavilion features a grand four-story rotunda reaching up to a large skylight that admits generous light during the day. The original spiral staircase, clerestory skylight and glass floor were removed in the 1900s. In 2013, the clerestory skylight and glass floor were reinstated to provide natural light to the rotunda and lower level. A network of ducts and vents was designed to provide fresh air throughout the building, although in practice it was never as effective as planned. A system of pipes and radiators was installed throughout the facility, significantly improving the comfort of the jail during winter. Traces of this serpentine network of pipes and wooden ductwork can still be seen in the building today. In the 1940s and 1970s, the original ventilation towers were removed from the jail's west and east wings, respectively. In 2013, the towers were reconstructed as intake vents for a new mechanical system. The architecture of the Don Jail was also meant to provide security and order. In the 1800s, English penal reformers John Howard and Jeremy Bentham promoted the principle of surveillance in prison design through octagon and panopticon plans. The panopticon arrangement consisted of radiating wings, enabling a number of cells to be monitored together from the location of a central tower or rotunda. This type of plan was adopted by architect William Thomas in his original drawings for the Don Jail, but the building scale was reduced to include just two wings radiating from the central block. Nevertheless, 
The Dawn Jail was the largest reform facility in North America at the time of its completion in 1864. The plan of the Dawn Jail was influenced by penal systems used in American prisons of the time, which promoted solitary time, work, exercise, fresh air, and natural light. This balance, it was believed, was needed for the moral and physical health of the inmates. At the Dawn Jail, work included farming the fields, shoemaking, sewing and mending, bathroom and laundry detail, and even hard labor such as breaking rock. At night, the inmates retreated to their cells for solitary rest. When first built, there were approximately 180 cells in the Dawn Jail, varying in size and detail based on their purpose and location. Today, there are a total of 10 cells remaining throughout the building. Six one-person cells, one solitary confinement cell, and one punishment cell, all on the lower level, and two iron cells on the fourth floor. Although the Dawn Jail was progressive in many respects, it was also the site of 70 hangings between 1869 and 1962, including the last in Canada. In 1869, a temporary gallows structure was constructed in the East Exercise Yard to the north side of the Dawn Jail. If the body of an inmate was not claimed by the family after an execution, the body was buried in an unmarked grave in the yard. In 2007, an archaeological team located the remains of 15 separate graves along the west and north walls of the exercise yard. The identification of the bodies was confirmed through analysis of the gender, stature, and age of each inmate, combined with examinations of newspaper accounts of capture and execution. In 1905, the gallows moved to a former latrine space in the northeast wing of the Don Jail so the room could be closed off when not in use. This was the site of the last hangings in Canada on December 11, 1962. In 1976, the death penalty was abolished. The Don Jail gallows were decommissioned shortly thereafter, and the macabre gallows structure was removed. Today, the space remains virtually in its as-found condition, with traces, or ghosting on the walls, of the gallows structure still visible for public view. All along, while the Don Jail focused on the rehabilitation of its inmates for their reintroduction to society, the poor, needy and disabled residents of Toronto were also provided with rehabilitation services just north of the jail property. The House of Refuge was built in 1860 and converted to an isolation hospital to treat smallpox in 1872. By 1891, diphtheria, polio and scarlet fever were also being treated at the isolation hospital. A brand new facility was built in 1893 and by 1904 it was known as Riverdale Isolation Hospital. Over the next 50 years, the institution continued to transform to meet the needs of the community, creating a training school for nurses in 1894, new buildings for more beds in 1911, and a measles ward in 1927. By 1957, the threat of epidemics was no longer as serious as it had once been and the hospital's mandate was expanded to include chronic illnesses and rehabilitative services, with specializations in orthopedics, surgery, oncology, neurotrauma, and amputee, post-cardiac, and palliative care. Today, Bridgepoint Active Healthcare is a global leader in research and treatment of complex health conditions and rehabilitation, with the facilities and resources capable of redefining healthcare.